Hello, and welcome to the live Printing Impressions webinar, Five Trends Shaping the Future of Print Manufacturing, sponsored by Nortec. I'm Mark Michelson, Editor-in-Chief of Printing Impressions and the host of today's event. Before we get started, let me take a second to point out the Tips for Attendees widget on your console. It's the blue one with the wrench on it. If you missed the Tech Tips video we played leading up to the webinar, you can always click on this widget for more information. All right, so let's move on to today's webinar topic. There are reportedly 35 graphic communication industry segments. Of these 35, 27 have traditionally focused on print. And of those 27, the only industry segments not negatively impacted by the internet and the growth of online marketing are those related to packaging. This applies to conventional, conventional package printing produced via offset, flexo, and gravure, as well as digital printing. The packaging industry is expected to grow at a rate of more than 12% from 2016 to 2024. Today's webinar will cover why packaging is one of the only industry growth segments, how printers can combine digital and conventional equipment to adapt to new industry trends, why digital packaging is a new market opportunity for commercial printers, how print electronics and functional imaging promise to play a growing role in packaging, and why commercial printers are using air and water to reduce waste and improve machine downtime. We have three speakers today who will address these topics. They include Dr. Harvey Levinson, Professor Emeritus at Cal Poly, Carl Jochum, co-founder and chief marketing officer at EPAC LLC, and Steve Zenger, president of the Zenger Group. We also hope to have time for a Q&A session at the end, so I encourage you to submit any questions that you may have in real time as the webinar happens. OK, Harvey, let's begin today's webinar with your presentation. OK, thank you, Mark. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Harvey Levinson, Professor Emeritus. Uh, at Cal Poly, uh, where I was a department head for over 30 years in graphic communication. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, why packaging is one of the only growth segments in our industry. Now, let me tell you where Mark got the figure of 35 graphic communication industry segments. Actually, we came up with that at uh, Cal Poly a number of years ago. We did a study. We wanted to see exactly what different areas of our industry exist, where they're going, how large they are, whether they're going to exist in the future, whether they're growing or not. And we came up with um, 35, of which 27 relate directly to printing. And as an example, some of the segments are uh, like commercial printing, newspaper printing and publishing, magazine, periodical printing and publishing, book printing and publishing, business forms, financial, greeting cards, in plan, on demand, on and on and on. And you know, of the, and in studying these segments, of the 27 uh, related directly to printing, um, packaging is the only growth area. It's the only area that has not been impacted negatively by the internet and the World Wide Web. All the others have. And this is one of the reasons why you're seeing such a great focus on packaging, um, not only in terms of uh, industry development and industry growth and diversification, but if you read the industry press, almost every day there are multiple articles on packaging, not so in other areas. For example, today, um, in what they think, there was an article about enhancing label production with smart workflow autom automation. They also had an article on how to successfully implement a smart label. Uh, yesterday, in package printing, there was an article on the future of digital corrugated technology. On and on and on. And on this first slide here, you see where I focus on the different areas of packaging, label printing, folding carton, flexible pack, pr package printing. And then I have three in green corrugated box printing, rigid plastics, and metal packaging. These are very high growth areas with great potential for commercial printers to get in, in, into these uh, areas. So there's a few metaphors that's been used in our field for quite a few years. Direct to, remember when direct to film was a big deal? 
then direct to plate, and then direct to press. Now, the new ones are direct to board for printing on preformed corrugated boxes, and direct to shape for printing on already metal or plastic containers, such as I have shown in the slide that you are looking at. So some of the new digital systems are printing directly on shaped objects for packaging. This is where one of the hot trends are, are today. So uh, you, know, you might ask, um, you know, why is it, why, why is packaging, uh, why has it become so viable? Why is it a growth area? Why is it a major opportunity for commercial printers to get into? Well, the answer is what I'm going to tell you right now. And you're not going to see this published. You might see something like this in economics publications and this sort of thing, but you're not going to see it in our industry press. Basically, it's a statement on the viability of the industrial market-driven interests of the Western world. Basically, the market-driven interests of uh, our society, uh, it works. Um, it's been accepted. It's now being accepted in Asia and other, other parts of the world. And, and basically, you know, packaging fits right into this kind of economic model. And it's not going to, it's going to continue to grow. It's going to continue to be an opportunity for uh, commercial printers and other printers to diversify into. So listen to what you're going to be hearing today, because you're going to hear, be hearing about opportunities for all of you listening in to grow your companies. Uh, and if you look at some of the trends and statistics, um, I just kind of very quickly generalized in what we see in the press. For example, Smithers Pyra, they predict uh, that the future of digital print for packaging to 2022, it was $13.2 billion in 2017, and it's going to climb to $23.2 billion in 2022. And then from markets in markets, you see the same kind of thing. Global packaging printing to grow from 120 billion in 2016 to, all, to 192 billion in 2026. And printing indices of America, they predict the same kind of thing, 12% growth from 2016 to 2024. So all of the predictors, all of the analyses you see is consistent in terms of the growth and development of packaging relative to all of the other industry segments in our field. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to you, Carl, to handle trend number two. Thanks very much, Harvey. I uh, appreciate the intro. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Carl Joachim. Uh, I'm the co-founder and chief, chief marketing officer for EPEC LLC. Uh, most of my career has been spent in uh, marketing assignments. Uh, and companies like Xerox and Ricoh uh, to bring emerging digital technology to market, working with commercial printers, implant operations, uh, data centers. So for over 25 years, I've been on the supplier side of marketing digital technologies um, to folks like all of you. Um, for the last uh, four years, I've been focused on packaging, and specifically, I'm involved now in a startup focused on digital printing for flexible packaging. The topics that I'll, uh, I'll touch on over the next few minutes will be, I'll give you a brief uh, intro into what the flexible packaging market looks like. Um, we'll talk a bit about the digital um, value proposition to brands, um, because in, in dealing with uh, companies that are buying packaging, um, the brand is really the thing that you're really focused on. And so marketers tend to have a high degree of interest in uh, how packages are produced and uh, the kinds of um, unique qualities that different techniques use for printing those packaging, uh, those types of packaging to market uh, can actually bring to bear. Um, and then lastly, I'll talk about some considerations for entering uh, the flexible packaging market uh, with digital printing. Uh, first of all, it'd probably be good to define what flexible packaging is. Uh, simply stated, it's bags, envelopes, pouches, sachets, wraps, etc. Uh, made of easily yielding materials such as film, foil, paper sheeting, often combined, which when sealed and filmed acquires a pliable shape. So virtually anything you see when you walk into a grocery store uh, that's in a pouch or a bag is flexible packaging. And one thing that's important to note 
is that uh, the statement there uh, that says often combined. So oftentimes you're dealing with materials that are laminated uh, to provide a, a printable surface on the outside and a barrier on the inside and things of that nature. So the materials uh, tend to get a bit, uh, a bit complicated. Um, when we look at the flexible packaging industry, um, it's, it's the second largest packaging segment behind uh, corrugated paper. It's a $32 billion industry uh, today, and um, most of it is consisting of uh, retail and institutional food, CPGs, or consumer packaged goods companies um, that are taking their products to market. Um, the growth in this industry has uh, been long attractive uh, to investors. Uh, it grows uh, pretty much in accordance with GDP, um, and it is growing at GDP plus maybe a point to two in general right now um, because of several market drivers that are taking it above the growth rate of, of GDP. Uh, there is a trend underway uh, for, the, from the, for the conversion from rigid containers to flexible packaging containers. Um, part of that reason is shipping. It takes up less weight. Another part of the reason is that they're lighter. And so with light weighting, uh, you can reduce shipping costs and storage costs. Um, we also see a move among brands to bring more sizes to the market. Um, in some cases, uh, these sizes are linked to uh, trends in, um, in, in diet and uh, what we're trying to do really to offer consumer different size packages that perhaps don't um, contain quite as much food uh, to be in line with the consumer's diet. And there are also studies around pay cycles where um, studies have shown that people tend to buy bigger packages at the beginning of the month and buy smaller packages at the end of the month, if you can believe it. Um, so there's all kinds of data out there that kind of links back to, um, uh, to some of the drivers behind, uh, behind flexible packaging. Um, graphics quality is another one. Um, Digital printing has not really been all that strong in, in packaging, perhaps with the exception of labels, um, over the last few years because the graphics quality just wasn't quite there for photo quality um, and high definition type graphics that brands really demand on their packages. Well, a lot of those quality hurdles have been overcome, and uh, so what we see now is uh, electrophotographic, uh, photo, photo quality, high definition graphics now being applied the packaging, uh, whether it be you know labels, folding carton, and now flexible packaging. Um, another thing that drives uh, the growth in flexible packaging is the impact on the environment. It's viewed as a more sustainable process. Uh, the process uses less material, there's less waste, it consumes less energy, less water, it has less emissions, and in general when you compare it to a process like Flexo or Rotogravure, uh, you will see perhaps as much as a 50 to 60 percent reduction in uh, those elements and their impact on the, uh, on the environment. We, uh, Harvey and I, was actually involved in this uh, going back about three years now, but uh, there was enough noise in the market about the, what was driving um, the flexible packaging industry, the packaging industry in general, actually, because packaging converters were being faced with demands for shorter runs, more SKUs, quicker turnaround time, and um, with the packaging companies that I had spent some time with, a lot of them couldn't tell whether it was a fad or what was a, it was an ongoing trend, if this was something that was going to sort of overtake the industry and change how it had functioned for so many years. Because the packaging industry has functioned in the same manner for many, many years. Um, converters have typically been forced to um, to provide commodities to markets. Uh, the price, it was a price driven by in many, many cases. And so converters were typically buying um, faster equipment, wider equipment, uh, anything to really get more efficiencies out of their operations. Um, and so that ran contrary to brands now coming to converters and saying, I don't want a long run, I want a shorter run, and I want more SKUs, and I want et cetera, et cetera. So we embarked upon some primary research. Uh, the research was conducted between myself, Cal Poly's Graphic Communications Institute, and Packaging World magazine. And in this, uh, in this research, we surveyed 550 companies that ranged from consumer packaged goods companies to commercial printers to converters to co-packers, trying to get a sense of what was happening in the industry. 
All in all, we collected about 5,000 data points and we published the research in late 2014. Um, the thing that really drove drove the, the discussion coming out of that that research was the is the data that you see on the right. Um, forty five percent of the respondents to this survey said we are introducing more product variations than ever before. Thirty six percent said retailers want more package sizes and configurations to fill up their shelves. 28% said we want to better tailor our marketing messages to specific demographic groups. And 26% that they're doing more promotions and want to continue to do more promotions. And I can tell you that since we've started EPAC a year and a half ago, we are seeing every one of those, um, those data points, if you will, uh, come true. Uh, so though that is the number one driver behind um, why digital printing is appropriate uh, for packaging at this time. So I'll say a little bit about EPAC. I think we're a bit of an interesting story. Um, after studying the market for uh, three years or so, uh, EPAC was created as the first 100% digital flexible packaging printer converter in the United States. We serve brands of all sizes, in particular small to medium-sized business owners because digital does lend itself to shorter runs, um, but also global brands with an interest in uh, stretching the technology and seeing what it can do for them, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Um, while needing very, very high graphics, graphic quality, quick turnaround, and economical short to medium run lengths. If you're a small to medium sized business owner, traditionally if you've gone to a packaging converter, um, you were told that run length, minimum run lengths might be 50,000 units, maybe more. Run length uh, would be one criteria, lead time could be as much as eight weeks. Um, and these small to medium-sized business owners, uh, frankly, you know, just can't afford um, the, the kind of pricing that goes along with putting together the infrastructure to, um, to produce uh, short runs. Um, our company is built around, uh, in each location, two HP 20,000s. Uh, it's a 30-inch wide web photo electrophotographic press, runs about uh, 130 pages per minute at max slower, the more colors you run at it. It's a seven color press um, and uh, it, it's a very effective machine for us. Um, EPAC is, is, is fully integrated for all intents and purposes in that we're a full service provider that takes in raw materials and from that we manufacture finished pouches, roll stock, flow wrap, and most of our products are primarily for the retail food industry. The digital flex pack value proposition is, uh, frankly, for those of us that have been around digital printing for a long time, it's not a whole lot different than it was 20 years ago. Um, in the packaging industry, it takes on a little bit of a different flavor, but not much. Uh, the, fl the flexible packaging industry, and folding carton for that matter as well, um, typically quote four to eight week lead time. Uh, we turn around jobs in 10 to 15 days. Um, economical short to medium length runs is obviously a strength of digital printing. High definition quality graphics, uh, the 20,000 prints at about 2100 by 2100 DPI. Uh, like all digital presses, there's no plate fees. Uh, it's capable of producing 92% of the Pantone gamut uh, within one delta E and 97% within, within three delta E. Um, it's great for multi-SKU orders, so even longer runs of 100, 200, even 300,000 units if they're spread over five, six, seven, eight, ten SKUs without the, um, the process and the cost of uh, producing plates. Multi-SKU orders also are uh, a, a good application for, uh, for digital printing. There's minimal waste. Uh, you can print to demand. You can reduce inventory and thus reduce obsolescence. Um, most brands will tell you that they throw away about 15% of the packages that they have made um, because they had to buy such, such large inventories and store them. And the other thing is that um, in the flexible packaging space, there, is, there are quite a number of um, companies that import their packaging from Asia. Um, est estimates range from 12 to 21% of packaging comes in from Asia. Asia and uh, it's obviously a good thing these days to be a domestic manufacturer. Um, I mentioned a little bit earlier about the, the interest, really, that brand marketers take um, in what you can do with digital printing for packaging of all types. 
Um, it certainly provides the ability for the brand to innovate and provides customized packaging through digital printing. Um, they're able to economically rebrand and reposition their products. We just finished the project with a sports nutrition brand. Uh, they wanted to completely rebrand themselves and redo the graphic design, uh, and we were able to work with them and bring their product to market very quickly. Um, we've worked with companies like Frito-Lay who run promotions very quickly. If you look at that Doritos bag on the right, uh, that Doritos bag was produced for a celebration of LGBT in Dallas, Texas, and all they needed was 50,000 bags to uh, coincide with the dates that this event occurred, and so we were able to participate in that. Um, obviously, you can, because of the time to market factor being so much more attractive, uh, you can rent, launch new products very, very quickly, and you can add variable data and content. The latest potato chip bag that you see on uh, right to the right of that, that comment uh, that's actually someone's picture, a photograph that was submitted, and um, Lays ran a campaign uh, through Instagram where people would upload their photographs and we would print those photographs uh, on the package uh, and ship off to the consumer a box of six potato chip bags with their picture on it. Um, digital printing allows for uh, the ability to color match to conventional printing processes, even roto. And in many cases, um, you even need to dumb down the digital a bit so that you can get the exact same match if your customer is looking to have an exact match. Um, we've talked about print on demand. Um, another area that we find is, uh, uh, in particular, uh, interested in digital printing are highly regulated industries that change packaging language often. Um, you certainly hear about that in the cannabis industry, for example, as regulations are being written on the fly. Um, and we've talked a bit already about buying uh, domestically made uh, packaging. Packaging that comes in from, let's say, China often has a uh, three-month lead time. Uh, once you lock in your order, you can't change it. Um, there are oftentimes quality issues and shipping costs can be exorbitant. So again, a lot of reasons why um, digital can be attractive to the CPG brand space. Uh, there are some unique marketing opportunities that are available uh, with digital printing. Um, if you look at those packages that are on the top, uh, you'll see that all of the colors are a little bit different. Uh, this is done with a software package called Mosaic. And what Mosaic does is it'll take a color pattern uh, and it will um, enhance it uh, and essentially create a, create a new snowflake. Uh, out of every package. So every package is unique through a different combination of how the colors are actually portrayed. Um, and in another case, you can see that these are actually different SKUs. Um, inside of those packages, uh, you can see that there could be a code or a QR code for that matter that's printed on the package and it can take, uh, it can take the consumer to, let's say, a recipe or to some internet-based experience. So increasingly, we're seeing the package being used as an on-ramp to an internet experience. When we look at, at the uh, brand market, the CPG brand market, um, I tend to look at it in, in three levels. You've got the big brands, the Colgate Palmolives, the Frito-Lays of the world. Um, they're, they're, they're very, very demanding, um, and they are very interested in pushing new technology to see what they can do to differentiate. Um, you'll find regional CPGs that are somewhat in between. Um, they have a sizable business. Um, not quite of the scale, obviously, of a Frito-Lay, but, but the, nonetheless, uh, they, they, they tend to have qualities that are more like a small to medium-sized business than they do um, a large global brand. And, and so there's a certain um, segment of the market that lives within this regional CPG space that's attractive. Um, from an SMB standpoint, that, in my opinion, is where digital lives. And so whether you're going after segments like snacks or pet food or natural organic food, which is growing like crazy right now, or coffee. Um, these are really very, very interesting segments. Um, and different sales approaches are needed um, to articulate the value proposition of digital. Oftentimes, a direct approach to the customer is the best way to go. Um, the packaging industry has traditionally used brokers and distributors quite extensively. And so the challenge there is getting these brokers to articulate a digital value proposition, which is somewhat very, very different uh, to what they have typically done in the past. 
And then as well, if you're going to focus on the SMB market, you have to be talking about inbound marketing and the ability to provide an e-commerce and web to print plat platform. So packages can actually be ordered over the internet. And that's the future that we see for um, how software will evolve in this space. Obviously, all this leads up to, um, so what does it take to enter the market? Um, the assets that I have on the right are typically what you would need for flexible packaging. Um, you need a laminator, a rewinder, slitter, and a pouch maker, or multiples of those. Whether you're talking about folding carton or, um, or labels uh, or corrugated, you're, you need equipment to do some variation on these uh, types of equipment. Um, and I see three possible ways to really get into the packaging market. Um, number one is uh, you want to get your toe in the water but not too deep. So you could partner with a, with a digital printer converter and you could learn the market. You could hire salespeople. You could develop sales skills, learn to understand how to communicate with CPG marketing people, learn about polymer-based substrates and structures and the kinds of downstream finishing equipment that are needed. And that brings your learning curve up a fair amount. You could also build flex a flexible packaging or a carton, uh, folding carton or a label printing operation onto a commercial printing platform. The asset investment would be about the same as the Greenfield and the, all of these assets uh, to the right or some variation of them would still be needed. But the plus would be you could, you could leverage existing back office and prepress operations. You might be able to sell to some of your current customers um, but you also may also find that as you enter into packaging and digital printing for packaging, that the core business may be a distraction. The third option is the approach that EPAC took, and that was to create a greenfield. It's a, there's a higher initial investment because all those assets have to be acquired. You start from scratch with no customers, but you also have no ba baggage. <clears throat> and you can certainly focus uh, on the industry uh, that you're trying to get uh, your penetration accomplished in. Um, and so with that, uh, I'd thank you, and I'd like to turn it back to Harvey. Thank you, Carl. <laughs> Very good. Um, I want to touch upon a couple of the items that uh, Carl mentioned, which was not part of my presentation, but it certainly uh, brought up a couple of thoughts that I want to share with you. One is I want to tell you the Asia model doesn't work anymore in the area of digital printing. Um, Asia cannot deliver on the time frame or at the quality level that we can uh, in, in North America. The three-month uh, lag time, lead time, is not good enough for package buyers today that are relying on short-run variable data and related technologies in producing uh, their packages. And the demand for high quality is so great these days that we're not getting it, we're not seeing it from Asia. And a lot of the packagers who went to Asia for their product are now coming back to the United States. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the impact of the Internet and the World Wide Web uh, that Carl had mentioned, uh, being able to integrate uh, Internet technology with print technology is becoming vital in the packaging field. I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about that in a moment. But to, uh, I guess, uh, review a little bit of what Carl had just said, you know, how do you enter this field? Um, I have five very simple ways of doing this. One is using your existing applicable digital presses. And I'm going to talk about some of those that are on the market today that you can use. Many of you may already have this technology. Then there are retrofit options where you can retrofit existing analog presses with digital heads. And then you can acquire, you know, if you wanted to, uh, applicable digital presses. Or there are hybrid presses. Almost every manufacturer of, uh, of packaging presses today are producing hybrid presses that combine analog and digital capabilities. And then uh, perhaps the simplest way to get started is to outsource, outsource to converters, perhaps such as Carl or others, having digital presses. Because if you're a commercial printer, you will find, if you surveyed your customers, you'll find that many of them have packaging needs, but never thought of working with you to fulfill those needs. 
But if you can put together a marketing program showing that you understand packaging, you understand label, flexible packaging, or what have you, and you develop a client base or using your present clients to develop work, you can begin by outsourcing to converters to help fulfill the needs of your present clients. So these are, I'm often asked, how do you get into this field? How do you break into it if you're a commercial printer? Here are five possible ways. Um, starting with labels, as Carl had pointed out, is perhaps the easiest way because label printing is not too much different than commercial printing. The finish again is a little bit different, but as far as printing images on substrates, um, it doesn't matter whether it's labels or anything else, it's an easy way of breaking into the packaging field. You can begin by test marketing your present and prospective clients. Uh, you can partner with converters to begin getting involved in this particular field. And this list is interesting. Here's a list of not all, believe it or not, this is not all, but some of the major players that have made this happen, that has made digital printing applicable for the packaging field. And you recognize these names. I don't have to read, read them to you. These are all companies that when they started producing digital technology, they didn't realize that they were going to be getting into the packaging field. Okay? They did not develop these digital presses for packaging. But they learned very quickly that packaging is a very applicable field for this kind of technology. Every one of these companies, Epson, Esco, Fujifilm, HP, Kodak, on and on and on, are producing products. They're OEMs for producing products for packaging, and they're focusing on the packaging field. Uh, HP and uh, Zycon and Xerox, they were the early people, companies involved in test marketing this. And they found that it works, there's a need, and then all these other companies jumped in to develop technologies to support uh, package printing. And then there are many, many software options. These are just a few. HP, you know, SmartStream and Xerox has XMPy. There are digital front end uh, software packages. Uh, there are 3D software packages, on and on and on. There are lists. I have them all. Be glad to share them with you in detail anyone, if anyone who wants to get in touch with me after this program. Um, and what are the hot areas? The hot areas are pharmaceuticals and health packaging, beauty, cosmetics, and personal care, and food and beverage, and home care. And uh, think of the kind of advertisements that you see on a day-to-day -day basis on television, okay? Pharmaceuticals. I mean, you cannot turn on a network and not see advertising dealing with drugs and health care care products. And you know, cosmetics and beauty and uh, food and beverage uh, products, uh, they are all over every medium that we deal with. Home care products, consumer products. Uh, the package is the advertisement. Package is the advertisement. And the marketers, they know this. And these areas are so hot. These are the fastest growing areas of packaging that exist today. Uh, so moving on to uh, some more technical areas, we're calling this trend number four, how printed electronics and functional imaging promises to play a growing role in packaging. You probably heard of the uh, cliche, the internet and things. Well, this is what this all relates to. You know, new digital technologies for packaging plays into the entire metaphor of the internet and things. Inkjet and electrophotography uh, is growing, particularly inkjet, even more than electrophotography. Variable data printing for packaging is big and growing. Packagers, marketers, they want to be able to personalize their product, not only for regions, but for individuals. Uh, near field communication, where you can use handheld devices, uh, your smartphone, your iPads, and this sort of thing to actually get information about a particular product, ingredients, 
uh, how it relates to you, to your health conditions, and so forth and so on, simply by aiming your device, if you have the proper application, at a product package in a store, you can get all sorts of information that relate to you about the product that you're looking at. RFID technology, uh, mobile device communication with packages. That's what's, you can communicate with packages with your mobile devices, or the package can communicate with you. And then there's clickable paper. This is a very interesting technology. Um, um, I just recently uh, wrote a new book uh, that is using clickable paper technology that allows the book to communicate with the reader. It's not, uh, not an e-book or the reader to communicate with the book. And I showed this product to, actually it was uh, to Jack Knott, who's of EPAC, and he said, hey, can we use this for packaging? And you certainly can. So using the appropriate app, clickable paper app is a Rico app. Um, you download that to your device, and if the product you're looking at um, is in the cloud, if the software is in the RICO cloud, in this case it's RICO, um, it can communicate, the package can c communicate with you or you with the package to tell you all sorts of things that are relevant only to you, your health conditions, your eating habits, your dietary needs, so forth and so on. Pay attention to these kind of things. These are the growing areas of technology for packaging. And what are the efficiencies that they provide? You know, printed electronics and functional imaging facilitate short run, shorter lead times in producing packages. It facilitates print on demand, minimum inventory, hybrid technology, on and on. All of these benefits can be part of the packaging experience using some of these new technologies. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to uh, Stephen uh, to take you into uh, trend number five. Thank you, Harvey. I appreciate uh, your presentation. Uh, welcome, everybody. And um, I'm Steve Zanger, President and CEO of Zanger Group in Buffalo, New York. Uh, we're a uh, direct mail focused commercial printing company. Uh, I'm going to talk to uh, talk to you guys about how air and water reduce waste and machine downtime. Really, we're talking about humidification in, in our plant and in one, from one particular installation. So I'll give you a little quick vitals on us. We were uh, founded in 1980, privately held family business. We have three production facilities here in, in the Buffalo area, 150,000 square feet of, ma of manufacturing and office space in our, um, in our, our group, 160 uh, staff. Uh, we have 24-hour operation here, primarily again offset and digital printing, um, letter shop, bindery, fulfillment and kitting in, in our, uh, our facilities. I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, our East Park plan in particular. So we, uh, we have grown through acquisition locally. Uh, we purchased some, uh, you know, com several competitors over the years. And um, in 2010, we bought a, a large competitor that had two plants. And they were uh, located, you know, in, in about 20 minutes away from our our operations. So we had, at that point in time, like five buildings needed to do a consolidation project. So we located this East Park plant uh, was a uh, distribution warehouse, and we converted it into our our printing uh, primary printing headquarters and our main production plant. So we now have three plants, and the, the kind of cornerstone of our our system is our East Park plant. Uh, it's a 127,000 square foot um, building with uh, office and manufacturing and warehouse space in there. Um, in terms of, of humidification, kind of walking into this um, uh, this point in time, you know, in our prior facilities, we had digital digital print, uh, and particularly sensitive to humidity. Uh, as well as offset and some direct mail handling. And the way that we dealt with humidification in those places was, you know, using kind of a kludgy combination of perhaps a consumer, you know, misters you might put in a kid's room when they're sick if you're desperate or to whole house type humidification using just uh, condensation type uh, humidification systems. We had some lower end, you know, high pressure misting type um, systems that used air and water. 
Um, and they, they kind of got us through. But when we did the East Park project, we, we realized that we wanted to make uh, humidification a, a little bit more of a priority in terms of, of what we built into this brand new state-of-the-art plant. So um, a little bit more detail on, on what we ended up doing. Uh, you know, our sponsor today is, is a vendor of ours, Nortec. Uh, and they make uh, the humidification system. We looked at uh, several systems. Um, they make the humidification system that we actually installed. Um, it is a uh, three three zones in our system here: um, the controller, and then we have uh, some water handling equipment up in in that facility that softens and and cleanses the water down to RO quality. Uh, and then that system pumps under high high pressure water uh, out to nine of these princess heads, which I'll talk a little bit about in in a, in a second. Um, out to nine of them out in the plant that are in three monitored zones in our in our facility. So we installed this system as part of our plant build out. So when we designed the plant in 2013, uh, we we also built in uh, as well as you know obviously air quality air temperature and humidity controls in key production areas of our, uh, our East Park plant. So the um, actual installation here, if you look, this is, this is a, uh, a you know, focused area of our, so this area that you see on this plan right now represents about 60,000 square feet of the 127,000 square foot building. You see kind of in the upper left-hand area, uh, it's that, that blue area, there's a, you know, call out uh, shows the the Nortec controller. Up in there is our our processing uh, systems, our, our water cleansing and softening systems, and the Nortec controller. Uh, up in a mezzanine above one of one of the uh, our kind of uh, lunchroom cafeteria area in the plant. And then if you see those, um, if you see those blue lines, and the each one of those little stars that are in this slide represent each of the princess heads. So our one zone uh, goes directly down from the controller in our pre-press and CTP area. Um, that's about uh, probably two or 3,000 square feet. Um, our digital printing facility has two of the princess heads in it. And uh, that's about a 10,000 square foot uh, area. And then uh, our main press area at the top of the larger area we have two princess heads across our main um, decorating and die cutting and, and offset press areas, and then uh, four more and two more heads in the bindery area and two more in our mail and letter shop area. So any place where we were handling paper and um, you know inside this this uh, temperature and humidity controlled area is where we have those zones. So each one of those. The, the, the press room, bindery area, that large area, as well as the pre-press and, and the digital printing each have their own humidity sensors so that when uh, there's a need for humidity in that area, the system will trigger. So talking about the heads themselves, and I, I wish I had a blow up on, on there. You can kind of see a picture of the head at the top of the slide there. But the princess head has, I want to say, like 10, 10 or 11 nozzles on it and a fan underneath. So when, and, and water is, is projected to that system under high pressure. So basically there is no air in the lines of the system. It is just high pressure water coming from the pump and controller. And the air is actually introduced as that water is aerosolized at release. The air pumps up through the bottom of the princess and out the cap where it then disperses the water being pushed out of the jets. So it's a very clean system and, and produces um, you know, kind of contaminant-free. You know, we don't have any of the dusting. We don't have any, any of the issues um, that you might have with, with traditional humidification systems. You don't feel any direct access to or you know, con contact with anything feeling moist. It's just a very subtle but very effective humidification method. Um, so in terms of, of our results of putting the system in, you know, I, for us, humidif humidification kind of was an, an afterthought. We, we had some problems in some areas, particularly our digital printing areas, 
and in our direct mail processing areas where static electricity could cause artifacts in either imaging, quality issues with imaging, or just paper handling problems. But it wasn't exactly a chronic problem for us, but we figured that since we were doing the plant, we would want to be you know, really you know, state-of-the-art with the, you know, the environmental controls, so we put the system in. And I can tell you that and my comment here is, you know, how do you measure what doesn't happen? We have had virtually none of the problems we had with paper handling and imaging artifacts in our, in our, in our production areas. Um, but we have experienced a lot of, of unexpected benefits. And again, a lot of it has to do with what doesn't happen. And what we find is our people are healthier. <laughs> They're actually not uh, you know, calling in sick. There's less likelihood of us actually having um, you know, a cold or something like that spread around a plant because the humid humidity in, in the operation keeps um, that content from flowing around people as easily as you might expect. We have very predictable quality in terms of our digital production facilities, very predictable paper handling in terms of how we handle. We have equipment that has greater uptimes, um, again, because we're not seeing the downtime. Um, the system itself has been really great. It's been highly reliable, automatic. Um, you know, it requires a certain amount of maintenance, but not an, an onerous amount of maintenance. Um, the system uh, automatically monitors in pretty accurate way the exact um, humidity levels in the zones that it's monitoring, and and releases the humidity into into those areas in short bursts, but very very effectively. Some other things that were kind of an unexpected um, benefit for this system was really how the system provided us, you know, with with a venue to tell our quality story. So when we tour clients and prospects through this plant, these princess devices are they're quite conspicuous. I mean, they're hanging, you know, around in the ceiling. You know, we have 14 foot ceilings in the in the plant. Uh, 20 foot ceilings in some places. And so when these systems trigger an entire zone, so in like our, our large press area, you're talking about seeing eight of them trigger at once. So you hear this click and then you see this water spray out around each of the princess heads. And every single time we have somebody in the plant and that happens, they look up and say, what the heck is that? And it gives us an opportunity to tell that story about how those systems make us a better, more effective quality supplier of their printed product and direct mail services. So it's a, it's a significant part of that, that story because it's an interesting thing that happens while people are there and it gives you an opportunity or venue to talk about how small things like humid, humidity management in your plant can deliver predictable, high quality, results to to the to the to the, the end product that and that's ultimately what the customer that's walking around the plant with me is interested in talking about. One of the things that I talk talk about when I tell that story is actually how much water and this leads to my, my last comment, how much water actually the system delivers into uh, into the atmosphere. So uh, we actually measure the water uh, that get, goes into the system. And since we put the system in, in 2013 when we did the plant build out to date, we have pumped almost 1. Uh, 1.83 million gallons of water into our environment using the system. And uh, that's, that in a peak day, 2,000 2, gallons of water being pumped into the environment and being pumped into the environment because the environment's calling for it. So we're in Buffalo, New York. A day like that is going to be a February cold winter day where the heat is on, the air is dry, and the system is operating a lot. But 2,000 gallons of water in a day. And that brings me to my last comment about a funny thing happened. Um, we, about, about a couple minutes, or not a couple minutes, a, a month or so after we moved into the plant and installed the system, we had a, 
unexpected visit by the town sewer authority people. A couple of engineers and the, the head of the authority not comes into our marches into our, our uh, reception area and says, I need to talk to the plant manager or the owner right now. We want to know what you guys are, what are you polluting into our community? And we're like, what are you talking about? So we walk them through the plant and the princess heads kick off. And the guys, the engineers look up and go, what are those? I'm like, well, that's our humidity system. He says, oh, well, that explains a lot. He said, the, the amount of water you've been pumping in isn't going into the sewer. The amount of money, the water that you're consuming in your plant, it's not going into the sewers. It's going into the air and to the people and your product here. We don't have a problem. But you have a problem you don't even know about. They said, you know, you pay for your sewage, your sewage rates based on the water you consume. So you're paying to dispose of water you're not disposing of. And they actually recommended we put in a separate meter for the system, and we pay just water only on that, which actually saves us thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars a year in in terms of our our rates. But it was a, an interesting uh, thing that happened when uh, when when they visited us. So that concludes my comments. I'm going to hand it back to Mark. Uh, thank you all okay. for listening, and uh, have a great one. Great. Well, we got about nine minutes for the Q&A session, so I encourage uh, all our listeners to submit some questions. But I'm going to start out with some, and we're going to kind of throw them at our panel uh, rapid fire here. Um, and, and this is really for uh, any of our panelists to answer and chime in. Um, wh what are some of the common mistakes you see with uh, commercial shops trying to enter the, the package printing uh, market space? Well, I'll jump in Anybody on want that. to take that? Yeah, this is one that I've encountered many times. Um, has to do with training your staff to enter the packaging market. Actually, has to do with training your staff to not only enter the packaging market, but to enter the digital market. Uh, for example, uh, sales training has to be different relative to training for uh, training for a traditional. Uh, commercial printing. Selling digital is different than selling uh, commercial. Uh, selling short run, sell, selling variable data is a lot different than selling commercial, general commercial printing. And selling packaging is different than selling commercial printing. So basically, you have to either train your sales staff or hire sales staff who are experienced in these areas. You know, uh, Carl, you mentioned in, in your presentation, you mentioned the word uh, brokers. Um, how does how do the brokers fit into the uh, packaging space versus, say, the commercial market? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, I know when we started EPAC, um, because we had a lot of knowledge among our management team uh, about the packaging space and who some of the key brokers were. Um, we began to talk to them about representing EPAC, and uh, they really struggled with um, understanding the EPAC value proposition and articulating it. Um, they've been accustomed to selling packaging the way they've always sold it, which is as a commodity based on price, selling it to purchasing. And, you know, our uh, value prop is you don't need to sell on price. You can charge a premium because of the value prop. And you're going to be talking to marketing people if you really want to get, uh, you know, to where the decisions are being made because that's where digital really has um, has some impact. And so, in our experience, um, having direct contact with the customer, direct sales, um, is is the way to go. And I would I would um, recommend that anybody that's interested in getting into this space, um, you know, hire uh, a sales specialist that understands the digital value prop, can converse with marketing people, train them on uh, the markets that you're going after, whether it be pet food or otherwise, and I think that would be helpful. All right. Well, you know, you're talking about uh, digital in general. Um, you know, what we're seeing in a lot of other markets, segments like direct mail, books, those types of things, kind of a shift from uh, toner to uh, production inkjet technologies. Uh, Carl, you're relying on indigos. Um, where does our panel see uh, the, the market going in the packaging space in terms of uh, electrophotography versus inkjet? Well, any answer that I would give would be biased toward electrophotography because, you know, my passion right now is flexible packaging and, and, and brands need to 
with the best possible imagery on the shelf. And so um, today, I think, for the kinds of substrates that we use, electrophotography is, is the best possible pr um, process. Now, inkjet also has applications in this space, uh, in folding carton, uh, and corrugated, uh, and in uh, labels. Um, but, um, you know, and then there's the argument of, is inkjet as good as electrophotography? And I don't know that I'm qualified to answer that, but um, uh, that's how I view that issue. Yeah. Right. Well, um, I'll jump in on this. Um, actually, I look at it in three different ways here. Um, ink inkjet is getting a lot of the play, okay? Uh, it's getting uh, yeah, a lot of publicity and, and a lot of use. But, you know, the, the, if you look at different applications, different technologies, it's not only ink that jet that's being used for packaging. For example, HP uses Electra Ink. Electra Ink is not inkjet, okay? Then Landa has its product, uh, which um, is, 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 is totally different. So, um, you know, you, you have to look at the OEM, you have to look at the technology and see what kind of consumables they're using and how effective they could be. Um, but I agree that inkjet for label, inkjet for uh, for a folding carton, and now inkjet for for a corrugated are really uh, growth areas in packaging. Right. Um, you know, looking at workflow in general, um, certainly in the commercial market, uh, web to print has become a, a huge part of uh, many printers' workflows. Um, how does web to print fit into the packaging space? Yeah, um, that's something that we um, we're looking at and very very hard. It's actually part of our of our vision and our strategy for EPAC. In that, uh, when you look at the packaging market, there are very few companies that offer you the ability to to buy packaging uh, over the internet and to upload artwork and have the automation behind it be true web to print software that actually takes out much of the prepress process. Um, so what you find are uh, software companies that, that understand this and that can offer not only the e-commerce portion but work with, with their customers, customers like me, um, to uh, develop what I would call as templates. So, you know, web to print and online ordering only works if, if you want to buy a package and you pick from 20 packages, I want that one, and then you can fulfill that order. Um, much of packaging has grown up as highly, highly variable, where the customer might come in and say, well, I want this kind of substrate, I want the film to be this kind, I need this kind of barrier, and by the way, my package size is a little bit different, so I can't really use the template. So there is a lot of time and effort uh, being put in by the software providers right now to provide a true e-commerce slash web-to-print experience that, that, that in addition to providing the ability to transact business on the Internet, um, it gives the converter the ability to um, mechanically or you know, uh, digitally handle the imposition and, and, and the color matching that's needed in order to produce the desired result. Um, I don't mean to jump around, but I do want to help uh, answer some of these uh, audience questions. Um, I think, Harvey, you mentioned uh, clickable paper, or, or I know, uh, yes. I thought it was you, Harvey. Uh, one gentleman wants to know, could you use uh, clickable paper for inventory control? I'm not quite sure what um, he means by that, but maybe you do. Well, um, I'm, I'm inclined uh, to say yes. Uh, because what it does, depending upon how the, the software is built, it allows the, your, let's say, mobile device to recognize a, an invisible watermark, okay, built into the substrate that has all sorts of information about the particular product. So if inventory items are part of the software, built into the software, yes, it can be used in that respect. And that's a very, uh, well, I compliment whoever asked that question. That's a very astute question. And, but I'm inclined to say, yes, it can work that way. Okay. Uh, Stephen, um, this actually was related to your uh, presentation. Um, 
Ken wanted to know if you could uh, give a uh, ideal uh, relative humidity ratio. Yes. Yeah, so we uh, we our systems across the board are set to to maintain forty percent relative humidity. So forty percent humidity in in the areas and and um, you know in terms of how we get there. Again, in the in the in the the dead of winter on a really cold, dry day, those systems are kicking a lot of water on. They're they're on you know on several times in the course of a minute for 30, 20, 30 seconds at a time. So it's it's running a lot to maintain 40 percent. But 40 percent is what the manufacturer recommended. It's what we maintain and what's delivered great results for us. Great. Well, very good. Uh, you know, I hate to say it, but unfortunately, I think we're running out of time today. Um, this. Certainly, this conversation could have continued much longer. On, on behalf of Printing Impressions, I want to personally thank Harvey, Carl, and Stephen for participating, to uh, Nortec for sponsoring this educational event, and especially to you, our audience, for attending today's webinar. Be sure to check out webinar page to get information on all our archived and upcoming webinars. If you would just take a minute to fill out the brief feedback survey that will appear on your screen next, we would be most grateful. Your feedback will influence the webinars we bring to you in the future. I hope to see you at the next Printing Impressions webinar. Thank you.